Hi, this isn't Kylie Minogue, and I love listening to Time to Talk. Now, there's a podcast floating around, and it is one that is of the highest caliber. Very unlike this podcast, right? It's called A Journey Through Stock, Aiken and Waterman. Many of you will already know all about it, of course, but this really is, it's a high quality piece of work. It's deeply researched. The hosts have interviewed many of the key people from the Hit Factory. And very, very important to me, it's a podcast that is raw and honest. It's a show that it doesn't glaze over the flaws and the complexities of the PWL years because there were so many growing pains when these guys were hitting the big time. And this is a podcast that isn't afraid to shine a spotlight on those growing pains. Yet at the same time, A Journey Through, Stock Aiken and Waterman is a genuine celebration podcast. It celebrates the extraordinary work, extraordinary work, the music and the talent that Stock Aiken and Waterman produced from uh, around the mid 80s, about 84, I believe, through to the early 90s. So look, if you haven't listened to it, and if you genuinely enjoy researched and detailed history, because that's what it is. It's a history podcast in many ways, like a time capsule. And this is definitely one that, what do they say? You can't afford to miss it. And one of those hosts is Matt, and he's with us in the fortress today. G'day, Matt. Great to be here in the fortress. I'm a fan of yours. Yeah, do you like the fortress, by the way? I do, I do, I do. I always um, listen to your podcast when I'm doing the dishes. <laughs> and that's where I had this epiphany. I was, I was cleaning the dishes, and I realised... This is gay talk back radio because I had a flashback to my dad um, doing the same thing, listening to his transist- transistor radio. And I thought, this is this is what this is. This is gay talk back radio. And you know what? You coined that term for me. You you sent it through as a text message, and I was I actually was I think I might have even told you I was in a hamburger shop and I was waiting for my burger, yeah. and you wrote, "Yeah, your show's like gay talk back," and I held it. And I even had to take my glasses out of my pockets and make sure I was reading it right. Gay talk, but I hadn't heard the show described like that. But I think you're very astute, my friend, because I grew up in a household where talk back was always on in the background or, the, you know, John Laws and all of that. So maybe yeah. I've picked something up subconsciously, do you think? Probably so, I'd say. Yeah. And I don't do this very often. Can, do you want to meet Baby Eagle the Dragon? Oh, yes, please. Here he is. He's on my arm. You just don't startle him. He's pleased oh. to see you. He's awake. Does give he him eat a little much? Pat? Sorry? Does he eat much? Uh, he, he He's a vegetarian. Oh, okay. But he makes yeah. exceptions, depending <laughs> on who's in the fortress. Did give him yeah. a little stroke there. Yeah. He, he's, he's a good dragon. Back he goes. There you go. He doesn't come out very often. He's like a koala. He sleeps most of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, I have to thank you, honestly, sincerely. Got my hands on my heart. You and your co-host, Gavin, every time I listen to your show, I genuinely just uh, I marvel. I, I genuinely marvel because the depth of work that is clearly behind what you put to air in each episode, it's extraordinary. Oh, thank you. That that really means a lot. That's really touching because it is a labour of love. Like uh, Gavin and I are both genuine, huge, huge fans of Stock Aitken and Waterman. And um, well, we also uh, are or were professional journalists. So we've got the sort of the, the skill base and the, you know, the skill set to sort of do this on a journal- journalistic level. So it, it's a real thrill to do it. And, you know, the, the reason I initially thought we should do the podcast was because I as a consumer could not believe there was no Stock Aitken and Waterman podcast out there yeah quite often you'd find like say on an 80s podcast or something someone would do an episode but and you'd listen to it and like it's just so often it would be riddled with errors and it was just so annoying <laughs> and i thought this is an incredibly important culturally important period of music and incredibly important to me and most people of my generation who are sort of of similar taste and I thought well time's ticking on I'm not waiting any longer for someone else to do this let's uh, let us do this and I'm so glad that we did it's been so fulfilling and the the single best thing about it is the reaction of people who listen and how much joy it brings to people it's really moving to me actually 
Well, they're probably like you were and like I was, like baffled that this hadn't been done sooner in a way because we know we've all heard snippets of the story and Mm. when you weave them all together, like I've heard from that person, that person, that person, that person, when you weave it all together, we knew there was a really interesting story in there. Your podcast really does what I would call a full 360 on those PWL years. You tell the story from so many perspectives through literally the words of the multiple guests that you have on the show, including the talent, the the singers themselves on occasion you have on your show. How did you manage to get so many people lined up for your project? Uh, I think there's two things going on. One is that because because Gavin and I were fans growing up and, you know, we used to pour over the back of the sleeves so we knew all the names. Me too. We knew knew Karen Hewitt and (laughs) Yo-Yo and all those names. Whereas I think so, perhaps if, if you weren't a genuine fan and say you're a journalist who has put on a job to do something about this, you don't have the background knowledge of who to approach and who they were and what was important. So we had that background knowledge. Um, and the other factor is that I think uh, a lot of people, the artists and people involved became aware very early on from the podcast that we were approaching this um, as fans, we weren't there to attack or rip down or disparage. And one thing I absolutely loathe is when people say they like a certain music um, as a guilty pleasure or they pretend that they love it ironically. I hate that stuff. I hate it. You yeah. either love music or you don't. And we genuinely love this music. We're not approaching this as, you know, oh, guilty pleasure sore or anything like that. We just love it. And we say we love it and why we love it. And people got that enthusiasm and they really liked the fact that we uh, valued what they did. And so most most people we've approached have been very happy to come on. And um, it's been an absolute joy to, to get them on. But it shines through, that journalistic background that you just described shines through in the responses you get. Because I've heard a lot of the people that you've spoken to, interviewed before, but they are so open with you. Like they're they're just, they have a lot of trust, clearly. If there's no trust, they're not going to give you truth. And it's clearly you, you both have that. Can I ask, is it very deliberate on the part of yourself and Gavin, your co host, that you get out of the way as the hosts? Um, Let me tell you what I mean by that. As I listen to your show, besides being in awe of the level of detail, it really strikes me that you both let the narrative be the star and the focus. It really feels like you've actually deliberately gone to some lengths to respect the story by letting it shine and you as hosts almost become more storytellers in a sense rather than commentators. Oh, thank you. Um, I think that that's just good journalism. And I think we, we've, we've all probably as consumers approached an interview with someone we, we're interested in and intrigued by and then become really annoyed when the interviewer inserts themselves or speaks over somebody or steers things in a direction they want it to go. And, and you can, you know, someone is about to give a good answer and they get interrupted or they're not listened to and they get taken off in a different direction. I just loathe that. So I'm really glad that we're not doing that. Although we, we do insert parts of our own story into it, like oh, our yeah. own reactions or what was going on in our lives at the time. But I, I would like to think we keep that, you know, separate from 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 the rest of it. So it is a bit, there is a bit about us in there as well. But as you say, we, we always aim that the vast majority of it is actually about the story and get letting people tell their story in their version of events. So, Matt, I'd, I want to take you back to basics because, believe it or not, and don't know how this happened, we actually have a lot of younger listeners. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, who would have thought? And they, they, they see me as the old wise Yoda. Yeah. No, I'm sure they don't. Uh, <laughs> but for the younger listeners, what was Stock Aiken and Waterman exactly? I mean, what was it and who were they? Right, so it's uh, Mike Stock, main song- songwriter, Matt Aitken, also a songwriter but an amazing musician, and Pete Waterman, who's like the P.T. Barnum. He's a showman, he's uh, a marketing guy, an ideas guy. Um, and they got together around about 84. Um, nobody really knew who most of them were, although P- Pete Waterman had a bit of a reputation. He was responsible for a group called Musical Youth. You might remember their song, Past yeah. the Dutchie. He'd done a few other things. He'd been around in the industry, but he was not a household name. And so they started um, working with some really edgy, edgy sort of uh, acts like Divine, the drag queen from the John Waters movies, 
they gave him his first um, top 40 hit in English speaking countries, at least with You Think You're a Man, which was considered incredibly sort of uh, countercultural at the time. That was a top 10 in their time, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so a lot of um, what would be called quote unquote gay disco or high energy stuff in the beginning. And then they sort of showed their versatility by morphing into soul pop. So they did a song called Say I'm Your Number One by Princess, which is actually one of my favorite songs of the 80s. Full Stop is just fantastic. It's one mm-hmm. of the first times I remember as a kid being really aware of production. I didn't really was understand. That Desiree? What- Desiree, yes. Is Desiree it? Heslop, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she was known as Princess. Princess. Princess, yes, which yeah. I think she objected to, didn't she? Oh, her brother came up with that name as a marketing idea and she said, no, 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 like I cannot live up to that pressure. So for, for, ki- for kids, you, you've got to know at the time there was kind of a pop royalty. There was Prince yes. who was at that time was one of the biggest stars in the world and she she just didn't want to be, uh, she didn't want people to think that she thought of herself as Prince's equal or something that grand. So she was really freaked out by it. But eventually uh, her brother, Don, who we also interviewed, um, sort of talked her into it. Pete Waterman originally didn't love the idea and he said, you know, that sounds like a dog's name, Princess. But um, in the end (laughs) they agreed to it and it did end up working because it was a top ten hit. Fantastic song. Just shows their sheer versatility. You can go from like a really hardcore sort of gay club track like uh, like You Think You're a Man and then go to some really, really credible, classy soul music like Say I'm Your Number One. Mm. Anyway, this can Continued on, continued on for a while, and then by around about eighty seven, they they hit this purple patch, where they started uh, having big hits with people like Banana Rama, like mainstream pop acts. Um, and then after that, uh, because Banana Rama's Venus was massive in Australia, that was number one here for seven weeks. Mushroom Records, which is the Australian label, were, were paying attention to this, and they uh, they formed a business relationship with Stock Aitken and Waterman's company PWL. And they got one of their engineers to come over to Australia on like a little secondment for six months. And one of the records, uh, that was his name was um, Mike Duffy, and he ended up producing a little record you might know called Locomotion by Kylie Minogue. Yeah, and this is where the link starts. So just to make sure we're really recapping what this was uh, and please correct me if I'm saying anything wrong here, but for me, if, if I was to tell people, younger listeners, what Stock Aiken and Waterman was, it's a hit factory, not unlike Motown, where they took people who were relatively unknown and very relatable, people you might live next door to, for example, and uh, made them stars. Uh, some of them had great talent, some of them not so much talent, but they True. did a great job on it, right? True. Well, I, I think the the phase when they became the hit factory sort of started roughly around when Kylie came into the picture. Although maybe I might put it back a little further to uh, Mel and Kim's respectable with the Tay Tay yes. Tay. That was just the moment when they just became mega. Com- they developed this mega commercial sense yeah. and started selling records to vast, vast audiences, including a lot of young kids. So, like the earliest stuff would have been gay guys going out to clubs. And then like around the Hit Factory time, they hit on this formula and hit on this audience, which had been underserviced, which were the younger kids with people like Kylie and so on and so forth. And that's when they became known as the Hit Factory because there was a phase where literally they could release almost anything they released would go straight into the top 10. And it was just a barrage of these songs, which is another reason why they were called the Hit Factory. And they had a signature sound, which, as you say, it it was it was ruminating there, but then it really hit its peak around that maybe eighty seven mark, where you could just tell a bit like what I say with the the Beach Boys or ABBA. You can sort of they had a sound, a, a resonance that you go, "Yep, that's that's a Stock Aiken and Waterman song." And I think many listeners will know that sound that I'm talking about. But one thing I often find that's a little bit underestimated is they 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 had a signature. Um, uh, if you call it a beat, in a lot of their songs, for example, outtakes from Laughs in the studio, in Respectable, you can hear that in lots yeah. of their tracks. And what about the I, 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 I from I Should Be So Lucky? They didn't yeah. mind throwing in a little bit of um, cheeky stuff like that too, right? Yeah, the the vocal locks became the, like the I, I, I and the Tay, Tay, Tay. They sort of became a signature. Vocal they locks. They sort of brought that forward. Wow, yeah. I finally got a term for it. I love yes. it. Yes, yes. Mm. And the samples, like the laughing on the Mel and Kim record was that was just when they were just chatting to the girls between takes and the, the girls were laughing and they just, they, it was all recorded, 
all recording while they were laughing and they so just chucked it onto the record and it was great yeah absolutely again it added to that relatability i mean and yeah uh, but but it be, is it fair to say that the stock aiken and Water, waterman um hit factory was an empire it know, was at its peak it really was wasn't it it was like i mean especially in the uk where they just dominated and i think they became they're a tiny little label and I, i've been to um uh, the location of their former studio oh, the wow. studio is no longer there the building's still there and so it's like this little old factory industrial kind of building in a really grotty back street in a then not very fashionable part of London. So there's this tiny company that ended up selling about something like 30 something percent of the, the singles in the UK one year. And that's against, you know, the mega massive companies like EMI and stuff just being slaughtered by this tiny company working in a back street just because they captured the zeitgeist and they knew what the public wanted. You're listening to Time to Talk. We're talking to Matt from the podcast Journey Through Stock Aiken and Waterman, a fantastic podcast that you all need to go and listen to. Matt, what did the music mean to you? Because you've done so much research, you've got so much detail in your head now, but back in the day, wasn't it as simplistic as the music was just resonating with you? What did it mean to you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I remember the first time I heard the Divine record and I was like probably, what would I have been, like 11 or 12? Um, very sheltered. I didn't know much about gay life or anything like that, but this quote unquote gay record, it just went bang straight to my heart. You know, there was something there. Mm -hmm. And then Dead or Alive, She Spin Me Around Like a Record, which is actually my favorite song of all time and my favorite Stock Aitken and Waterman record. Just loved that. Loved that. And, and as I understand it, just to linger on that for a minute, Dead and Alive, Dead or Alive, uh, they wrote it and then it was handed to the hit factory people for a spin and there was a bit of reluctance and fear about it. <laughs> what are they going to do with this track? Is that right? Yeah, well, according to Pete Burns, he, he said in a couple of, uh, the singer from Dead or Alive, he said in a couple of interviews that the, they were really, the boys were really reluctant to do yeah. it. Like they, they wanted to make a rock record at that yeah. stage in the early stage. And um, but but Pete Burns really pushed it. He said, "No, I want it to sound like this." And the, the record company was really dead set against it to the extent that uh, the band had to take. Well, Pete had to take out a personal loan to pay for these sessions oh, wow. because the record company would not pay for them. Wow. That's how little faith they had in the record. And then the re and you know when it came out, the promo was terrible because the record company didn't care. And it took like three months to get into the top 40 after release. And it was just because it was just built and built and built in the clubs. And once it reached that critical mass where it just scraped into the top 40, that means in, in, when it was in, when a song was in the top 40, that meant you could be on top of the pops. So the band were then on top of the pops and then like, because they got that mass exposure outside of the clubs mm. on top of the pops, it just launched straight up to number one. It was just extraordinary. It's like a runaway train after That was months. music in general back then, wasn't it? I liked those yeah. days where you'd be onto something as, a, as an individual and thinking, oh, look at it, it's just down the bottom of the charts and I've found that no one else knows. But yeah. back in those days, it could easily just take off. But these days, if it doesn't take off in the first couple of 48 hours, you you're doomed. I, I, I really love what you said about what the music meant to you, Matt. I, I remember uh, I didn't know anything about Hip Factory and who was producing it and even some of the artists, but when I had my headphones on, lying on the beach at Bondi <laughs> in the yeah. sun, all that music, as, as it did with you, just resonated with me straight to my heart. It's like, oh, I just love the sound, the synth, the it was yeah. almost tinniness. I can't even quite describe and put into words, but it got to me and I was hooked. Yeah. Well, if you if you take your mind back to like the mid to late -ish 80s in Australia, the music scene here and the media was incredibly restrictive. It was just all rock, like pub rock, Oz rock. Soft the, rock. Yeah, the radio stations <laughs> would not play pop and dance music. And I know that's really hard for younger people to believe, but they just would not. Yeah. It was like it was like white straight guy music, which was what the you know, who all the programmers were and all that sort of thing. And you had to be holding a VB to listen to it. Yes. And so like th these Saw records were because Saw would be Saw would be listening to what was going on in the clubs, like the really edgy new club music. And they would take those flavors and put them on commercially accessible pop records. Mm -hmm. So like um, their pop records were the way that suburban kids like me could get a taste of what was happening in terms of high energy and then house music, because Showing Out by Mel and Kim was the very first British commercial house record that made it into the top 40. People forget that now, that mm. Saw brought house music commercially to the UK. Um, and I remember 
I remember the first time I heard Showing Out, I was just gobsmacked. I thought it was just that I'd never heard anything like it. And my friend Tony said to me, we were talking about it uh, after we did it on, on our podcast, he was talking to me about the episode and he said, I remember the first time I heard that and it sounded like the future. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly what it sounded like. Because, wow. you know, listen to all those dreadful Oz rock records from the 80s. It was all exactly <laughs> the same. It's like it, it, as a form of music, it was a dead end. Like it never went anywhere. It was just the same thing. And then these f- this new flavours came in and you're like, your head explodes when you listen to it. As a young person, it's so exciting. Like, I want to, that's me. That's me. I feel that. That's like an audio imprint of me. I want to attach myself to that. And I just went nuts when that Mel and Kim record came out. I had them all over my walls and with the posters. I uh, ran down to Adelaide people listening. I ran down to uh, uh, Westlake's Mall, CC Records, and and got my tape of, of the FLM album. And I just played that over and over on my ghetto blaster in my room listening to, while doing my homework. <laughs> Good days, weren't they? And and. You're absolutely. I hadn't thought of it like that. We, we there was an audience there at the time in Australia. I'm talking about that just wasn't catered for, and it's no. not like you could hop on the internet and and do your own and no. uh, set your own playlist. So you're absolutely right. It's probably what resonated with me too, because in my household it had been older brothers, sisters, parents, soft rock, all of that sort of stuff. And all of a sudden this felt like, ah, this is mine. Finally, someone's delivering. Can we go through some of the stars that went through the hit factory, right? I mean, Mm. my God, my God. I mean, let's start with some people who were established who went through the hit factory because they knew that the hit factory was on a winner at that stage. Donna Summer and Cliff Richard, for example. Yeah. Yeah, but there there was a whole stable of stars, though, wasn't there? Yeah, so D- Donna, um, as many people will know, um, was probably, if not the biggest star, one of the biggest stars of the 70s, like in the disco era. And then she, at, at around 80, she she went to a new label, which was Geffen Records, which is David Geffen's label. And he he's a very, very much a rock guy. So he just didn't know how to handle her. So she had like this whole period of mediocrity in the mid to early 80s where she was just a shadow of her former self commercially. And then she was in Europe with her husband, Bruce Sedano, who also managed her, and they heard the Rick Astley record, Never Gonna Give You Up, and he said to her, you know, Donna, this sounds like you. You should do this. And Donna had her first top ten hit in a very long time. This time I know it's for real, which was massive all around the world, but not in Australia for some reason. But the Young Divas covered it many years later and had a huge hit with it here, just showing intergeneration, just showing intergenerationally super high quality songwriting will always speak to people if you just you know reproduce it tweak it a little bit it'll speak to the next generation as well but it speaks to how big this factory got that established stars who were looking to either resurrect or finally get a hit after a number of years in the wilderness would be coming to them but where it started was those sort of unknown people and that's what they were best known for right so we're talking mel and kim um rick astley Help me out here, Kylie and Jason. Obviously, um, yes. Uh, Sonia. Oh yes. How'd you feel about Sonia? Did she connect with you? <laughs> I love. Look, Sonia. The PWL Hit Factory experience, in my opinion, is different if depending on where you were living. So in the yeah. UK, I think that you got full throttle. Over here, not all of it seeped through in the mainstream, at least. So Sonia, I only discovered. Get this. Here's a memory coming back. Because I was determined to have the hand on your heart video on cassette and I couldn't get it anywhere for some reason. So I bought this compilation, Hits of 89 maybe, the yeah. uh, VHS tape, and yeah. Sonia's, Sonia was on it. And that was the first time I'd ever heard her. And I went, this has got to be Stock Aiken and Waterman. It sounds like Stock Aiken and Waterman. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, she did resonate with me, but I didn't get much further than that until Spotify came along and now I know all her stuff. Yeah, she was a funny one because if, if you look at her um, chart position, she was really only big in the UK and Ireland and she didn't take off elsewhere. Yeah. But she was yeah. like, she to me, she, you know, th- this brings up an interesting point because after Kylie arrived and Kylie had the massive success, it really forced a reorientation in what Saul was doing before they were sort of more clubby and, um aiming for a sort of an older audience and after Kylie came along and she had you know this massive hit with I should be so lucky 
uh, part of the reason I should be so lucky was so huge was because you had all the neighbours viewers, which were kids, and off and a part of that demographic was very young kids. So you've got this whole new demo of record buyers who came along and bought this record, and then like I saw just saw that and decided that they were going to orient a lot of records towards that market. So around about uh, probably by eighty nine ish, they started. Um, you taking this A&R position where they were really aiming at quite young kids with acts like the Reynolds Girls, which in my opinion is their rock bottom moment. I'd rather Jack than Fleetwood Mac. Mm-hmm. And a band called Big Fun, which was just this horrible boy band with terrible vocals, which was re- aimed at- Was that the one at- that did Blame It on the Boogie? Yes, correct, correct. Oh, that correct. was horrible. That was horrible. So, like, uh, I mean, that's when I, because I was 17 in 89, so I started to become a bit alienated by that a and direction. And coincidentally, that's, you know, at the end of that cycle, that's when their sales just plummeted. And they sort of tried to crawl their way back with clubbier records. But by that stage, I think they'd done a bit of brand damage because in pop music, cool does matter. And if people are associating their brand with, you know, dreadful stuff like I'd Rather Jack, they're not going to, you know, listen to the fantastic Sybil record that they made, for example, because they did go back to making sort of more cred but still pop and commercial stuff in the early 90s, but they had a lot of trouble getting people to reconnect with it. Hey, time to talk family. This is Tim Power host of the podcast where amateurs talk about icons to keep our show commercial free we rely on your support many of you have chucked in just a couple of bucks or sometimes more which lets time to talk australia pay its way there's no obligation of course keep listening to us no matter what liking and sharing our content is also a huge help But if you do hear something that you like and you think you can support the show by throwing in a couple of bucks, head to patreon.com forward slash time to talk Australia. The link is in the description of this podcast. Hi, Tim and time to talk listeners. This is Danny from Melbourne. And I'd just like to say your latest podcast made me very angry. And as always, we want your voice memos. If you've heard something that you agree with or possibly you're outraged, And let's be fair, many of you listen simply to be outraged. Then take out your phone and record a voice memo. Cap it at around the two minute mark and then send it to me. I listen to all the voice memos that come through and occasionally we include them in the show. Our email is timetotalkaustralia at outlook.com. Thanks for sharing, rating, contributing and donating to this very little podcast from Down Under. I genuinely love our Little Time to Talk family because lovers of pop are an endangered species. So why don't we go extinct together? So that's all I have to say. Get off the airwaves. You're such an amateur. So we've had this huge stable of stars. And as I understand it, and my memory might be confusing a few things here, but I think they even released a song themselves, didn't they? Was it called Roadblock? Correct, yeah. They, Did it they, have hints of Better the Devil You Know in it from memory? Well, I had, whoa, so I had that. There you go, there you so go. So the, the thing with Roadblock was um, there was a trend at the time called Rare Groove, which was which all the really sort of snobby up-themselves DJs, um, nightclub DJs were into, which was like sort of 70s funk, rare 70s funk. So they decided they would make this record that sounded like it was a, a, a rare groove record, that it was something that had maybe been made a funk by a funk band in the 70s and it had been sitting around in a box and some DJ found it. So they put it out on what's called a white label, which is just a, a, an unmarked um, 12-inch single with just a white label on it with their, without their name on it. They distributed it and all the DJs just fell on it like vultures and thought, uh-huh. this is fantastic, this is an incredibly cool record. And it became, it got played everywhere, and then they put their hands up and said, uh, "Hey, it's us." Oh, and stop it! I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. How embarrassing for the DJ, the credible DJ set. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so they gave them a bit of a bloody nose, but um, you know, well done because I, I'm not a huge Red Groove fan, but it was an extremely well executed record. Roadblock, if you, if you haven't heard it, give it a listen. 
Stock Aiken and Waterman, they had 13 number one singles from 1984 to 1993. They had more than 100 top 40 hits. That's why it's called a factory, folks, 100 mm. top 40 hits. Uh, but, but you've already touched on it, Matt. I really feel like this, this hit factory was fantastic already, even with Banana Rama and what had gone before. But when it intersected with anyone who lived through this time, you had that brewing and doing really well, that factory. And then over here, we had this show, Neighbours, which was just it, just when you thought it couldn't get any bigger, it kept getting bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger. And then they sold it to the UK. When you had the intersection of this hit factory with the Neighbours phenomenon, with the juggernaut that was Australian soap opera, would it be fair to say that's when it was like igniting a firestorm? It absolutely was because that you've got two powerhouses of youth culture. You've got pop music and you've got Neighbours because for those who weren't around, when, when Neighbours was at its absolute peak, like around 87-ish, 88, if you're a, a young teenager in Australia or in the UK and probably other places as well, you watch Neighbours every night of the week. I mean, seriously, it was like the vast majority of people would watch that show. Absolutely. That's, un, that's unthinkable now in this age of digital viewing where the audience is so fragmented but it was a genuine phenomenon yeah and it was especially huge among young kids with you know the uh, the young cast uh, Kylie Minogue Jason Donovan Guy Pearce Annie Jones just massive 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 and the you know that's something that Mushroom Records in Australia picked up on they they acknowledged this huge following when you know they Kylie was shopping this uh idea of getting a record contract with her big band demo of um, locomotion and they considered it for a while and they decided to take a punt on it because back then it was unheard of that a soap star would be given a record contract and then have success so it was a bit of a risk but over it over in the UK um, when, when uh, Mushroom took Kylie to the UK to get a follow-up to locomotion from Saw. Nobody at Saw knew who Kylie Minogue was. Nobody knew because you know they're all adults working, working nine to five or even longer hours. They're not at home in the afternoon watching Neighbours. They don't understand. They don't know. Nobody knew ju- this huge phenomenon that was going on under their noses. And you know it was David Howes, the managing director of PWL, saw something in Kylie. So he was like, "Yep, yeah, bring her over. We'll do something." They recorded I Should Be So Lucky and then they tried to shop I Should Be So Lucky to all the UK record companies. They just wanted to get it, get a deal for somebody to release it and not one record label would take the record, even though the licensing was allegedly between £500 and £1,000, just basically wow. giving it away and, away and none of them would pick it up. And that, for the record, included Simon Cowell, the, the supposed great pop genius of our era. He just <laughs> turned it down. He turned it down and he said since that is the biggest regret and the biggest embarrassment of his life that he turned it down. Imagine turning down I Should Be So Lucky with a licensing that was maximum £1,000. It's just unbelievable. Oh, of, because course it's, it's, it, of course it's, it seems ludicrous, but at the same time I I, I know she was already big and Neighbours was already big, but the we- it was still getting bigger. Like The wedding hadn't happened from memory at that stage, had it either? Not in the UK it had. No, no. So, look, I can understand, as you say, why adults, the, the kids would have been like, you're crazy, pick it exactly. up. All the uh, people working jobs and making music. Plus, let's not forget that this whole idea of you take fame from one area and then you cross-pollinate it over here. So, in other words, the soap opera actress mm. uh, into a pop music. That seemed uh, crass almost at the time. Well, it's pretty unheard of. And when you think about the extent that Neighbours stars impacted the pop charts in Australia, which for a while was big, that just illustrates the fact that it was one of the very few mediums that allowed teenagers to connect with idols and to hear music because they certainly could not ever hear it on the radio. Yeah, I, I think Countdown, which was like our top of the pops, I think that expired about late 87. So that was like even shows like that were gone by this stage. Mm. So mm. Neighbours was just this super conduit for youth culture and pop music. And Kylie was just there at the right time and she was a pioneer, like nobody had done it before. And 
no. bang, you've got this record, which was just uh, locomotion was beyond huge in Australia. And I always think of it, the Mike Duffy version that went to number one, it was like a pop revolution. Mm-hmm. It was a cultural revolution among kids because it was Mike Duffy himself said that he made it sound like dead or alive. He originally, the demo that came to him was big band. Can you imagine Kylie releasing a big band record of locomotion and what that would have done? <laughs> if it had been a hit, it wouldn't have been as big as the version we got. And, you know, in Australia, there weren't that many pop producers who had their fingers on the pulse of what was happening. We're just incredibly fortunate that Mike Duffy happened to be in Australia at the time and bought all his pop knowledge from PWL and got out a Dead or Alive record and he had some session guys from a band called um, Boom Crash Opera and said, can you get can you get me some drums like this Dead or Alive record? So we didn't even have like all the drum machines and stuff that they had over there. It was like so, it was somebody from Boom Crash Opera trying to replicate replicate the beat from a dead or alive record on a drum kit but you can hear the influence because i mean i would argue and it's only my assumption that jug 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 that i mean that must have been influenced by what they knew of what was going on over there in the uk yeah mike duffy told us that the chug chug was sort of inspired by the tay tay Oh, did Mel he? King. Okay, yeah. I hadn't heard that episode. All oh, right. Well, I, yeah. I'd always assumed that I was always like, there. there's something in the middle. And look, if anyone listening wants evidence that there was uh, this was a, a, a new and strange phenomenon to go from acting into music, go and look at all of Kylie's earliest interviews. There's barely one where the question, so what are you going to do? Acting or singing? What do you prefer, <laughs> acting or singing? Because people were like, "Oh, hang on, this is this is unusual." It was a point of difference at the time. It absolutely was, yeah. Mm. And you know, it's a, it's a way to get attention because we all knew Kylie, yeah. And it was just like the, the number of you know coincidences or moments of perfection that were involved in that record happening. I mean, neighbors could not have been hotter. I, I could just remember sitting in. I, I'm just flashing back now, sitting in one of my art classes and just listening uh, you know doing a project and listening to all the girls talking about what happened on neighbors last night and mm. the fact that um charlene's caravan had exploded and then they were, <laughs> they were talking about oh, are we going to see her wear that that green top again because um it was in the caravan and it blew up and they were the, all this sort of stuff it was just like the absolute zeitgeist the, you know the it was it was huge yeah. and, and uh, that's i i do miss those days just in general not a, not only neighbors but where you'd arrive wherever you arrive the next day school work wherever and and you'd say did you see so and so last night and you'd all know what you were talking about that's sad that that's gone in a way i often say and maybe it's maybe i'm conjuring up an idea that's already there but netflix stan if you have a live event please do it and don't put it then available for people to watch just play it once and then that's it. And no one's allowed to download it and stream it afterwards. I'd like to have that feeling just one more time. Yeah. Uh, going back to, to Stock Aiken and Waterman, Matt, they, I feel like looking back, they weren't only selling music. They were absolutely selling just happiness. Do you oh. agree with that? Yeah. Well, you might have seen on the back of some of the records that sort of it sort of started after Kylie's success. They started putting this phrase on the back of the single, the sound of a bright young Briton. Oh no, I've never seen that. And that's so that's like it was it's about happiness, joy, optimism. Um, Mike Stock, who's the main songwriter, I think he was really into love. So you wouldn't often hear many songs about sex from Saw. Mm-hmm. Um, you might hear songs about heartbreak, but you would never hear songs about, you know someone wanting to top themselves or tragedy and horror and darkness. <laughs> Much more simplistic, right? Yeah. And, and, and my other thought when I think of Stock Aiken and Waterman and their brilliance was that they were manufacturing everyday people, music, and as I say, happiness. But the other one was hysteria. When you think of the Beatles and that hysteria that was there that we you can see in archival footage, uh it genuinely was there throughout the PWL years, but they they manufactured it, at least at the beginning, right, until it took off and became organic. Yeah, well, I mean, that was especially the case with Kylie and Jason in Britain. 
it was like there is so much like you, you can find archival footage of from the late 80s of the mob scenes in in yes. london where like kylie or jason might be at something and there's these scary crushes and people trying to grab at them and like J- jason donovan now he had you know some success in australia but he it, i don't think australians have most australians have any comprehension of just how huge he was in the uk True. like his album 10 good reasons was the biggest selling album of 1989 in the uk that's back late 80s when record sales were huge imagine having the biggest selling album that's how huge he was and he went on this tour that uh, they used to do uh a hitman roadshow where they'd take a bunch of saw record saw artists around to a bunch of um towns um, and it'd sort of be all ages so like young kids could get in and you'd get in and you'd pay like a tiny a tiny amount of money and you'd get like a, a coke and a burger and a, and a ticket in the thing so it wasn't aimed to create profit but it was aimed to create uh record sales and hysteria and the the mob scenes for jason at these hitman roadshow um dates which would often be you know quite often they'd go to places where no one ever toured like they'd go to these really small provincial towns and stuff so all the teenagers would go and they would have these insane scenes of hysteria where like literally dozens of ambulances would be called to take the girls away because they were hyperventilating (laughs) and it it got to the point where like there were were all these really hysterical articles in the newspapers you know um, parents terrified that their kids are going to die in crushes and Mm. you know how dangerous it was and and Jason Donovan spoken about that he said it was a calculated a calculated move by Pete Waterman to create this buzz where it actually made the evening news where they would show footage of this. So, and that creates a snowball of attention and uh, interest. Well, and that leads me into uh, Pete Waterman. He is a very, very interesting character. And I have watched his interviews over the decades and seen different stories evolve and change and twist and turn. Uh, first of all, my first, I've got a double prong question for you. Did you get to um, talk to him as part of your podcast? Forgive me for not knowing. And second of all, what kind of character is Pete Waterman? Pete's been approached. Um, he's one of the few major ones who has presently declined. We have had Mike Stock and we've had Matt, Matt Aitken. Matt Aitken being a huge, a huge coup because he never gives interviews. Yeah. Well, not ne- very, very rarely. So that was awesome. Now, we do know that Pete listens. That's what we were told. Apparently, we were told that, uh, you know, he's just enjoying listening at this stage. So that's great. I think Pete... I'm sorry, like- can I interrupt? The, the man that I know, I know you're about to tell us what what kind of character Pete Waterman is, yeah. but in my opinion, if it's true, and I'm sure it is, that Pete Waterman listens to your fantastic podcast... This is a man who would almost choke in wanting to respond to half the things on there, I would have thought. That's exactly right. And the thing is, if for those of you listening who are really aware of the Saw story, you'd know that Pete Waterman was the mouthpiece all through the 80s and the 90s and up until the early 2000s. Whenever anyone did anything on Saw, he was there giving his version of events. And he is a colourful character. He's got a marketing genius mind. So quite often stories would evolve to become more exciting and interesting and headline grabbing uh so but that has started to erode his his control over or his dominance in the narrative has started to erode in recent years mike stock stepping forward more matt aitken is now stepping forward especially on our podcast david howells who was the managing director is now being heard more so the story is becoming much more textured, nuanced, multifaceted, and accurate. And accurate being one yes. of the key words. And, you know, because Pete being the front man and being being the media face, he always had these crazy stories like, um, oh, he said that he wrote Too Many Broken Hearts, the Jason Donovan classic, on the toilet in 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, the truth of that story is that he went to Mike Stock, who is the actual songwriter, and said, what about something like there's too many people walking around with broken hearts? And then Mike, Mike Stock broke that down into an actually better title yeah. and then wrote all the lyrics in the song around that concept. So there's a bit of a difference between that and saying you wrote the song on the toilet, isn't there? But, you know, he's P.T. Barnum, isn't he? He's a storyteller. He's a storyteller. And with Kylie, he said that uh, 
he co-wrote the song by fax. I should be so lucky by fax. But what actually happened was uh, Mike and Matt wrote the song and Pete wasn't there because Pete forgot that Kylie was coming in and Pete was off somewhere up north chasing trains. And so the guys put it together themselves. Whether or not Pete might have faxed some ideas, I don't know, but he wasn't there. And the the idea of I Should Be So Lucky, so many people have claimed where that title came from. Um, there was a guy called Pit Stop who was a promotions guy. Apparently one of his catchphrases, well, people would ask him how his love life was and he'd say, I should be so lucky. And allegedly he said that. Mike Stock said I Should Be So Lucky came from hearing about who Kylie was because he had no idea who Kylie was. And David House said, oh, she's an actress from Australia. She's won a Logie Award. She's on a hit show, blah, blah, blah. And he thought, wow, she sounds really lucky. There must be something wrong with her. Maybe she doesn't have a love life. She's got all that. She's got wealth. She's got success and fame. What wouldn't she have? Maybe she doesn't have a love life. Oh, she should be so lucky to have a love. That's where that's allegedly where that idea came from. I, I think probably Mike and yet Stock Pete's being, story is entirely different, as you said. I, I, I didn't know. I haven't heard the one about the facts, but I do know that the classic story, the one that most fans hold on to because he's delivered it, is she was sitting there crocheting or doing something in the waiting yeah. room, and they were knocking on the door, and the receptionist is in there. And goes, oh, she should be so lucky. That's yes. as simple as the story from his that, point of view. That's his version of events. I am more inclined to believe. Um, the mic stop version and the pit stop version probably that probably throws in some truth as well well me too matt only because i know kylie so well and when kylie tells that story she's so respectful so dignified she never come out and said yeah but she always has a bit of a furrowed brow when people relay that story to her and it's like yeah that's not the whole story at the very least whenever i listen to tim and his panel of guests my toes begin to curl and I feel just the right amount of tingling all over my aching body. Now, let's get back to the show. Ooh. And the other thing we should talk about right now is the fact that, you know, uh, people credit Pete Waterman with Kylie's success. But the fact is there was one person at PWL who was the driving force to sign her, and that was David Howells. Because he he was familiar with what was happening at Mushroom Records. He knew the background. He got a demo from them of Kylie singing. He liked her voice. And he really pushed it. He really pushed it and said, we've got to sign this girl. We've got to do it, blah, blah, blah. So he's if you're going to look at one person and say, why did Kylie get a UK record deal? It's David Howells. Then, of course, the boys, Mike Stock, Matt Aitken and Pete Waterman, they combine their talents to create the actual art, the song, the production. It all it all goes back to it all goes back to Mushroom in Australia who took a punt on her. So thank you to them. But listening to you though, and listening to your podcast, and listening to you now, it sounds to me like you've become very passionate about the fact that there are a lot of characters in this story who are unsung and uncredited. Would that be fair? Absolutely, that's definitely the case. It's it's so many talented people involved there. And most of them were, were working behind the scenes, beavering away, beavering away through the night, doing really hard work. Like any any Saw fan would know names like um, Phil Harding and Ian Kerner. You would have seen their names on the records. Yeah. Well, they used to come in at night and um, sometimes. And Phil Harding would come in at night. He, he Phil Harding's actual, uh, he, his his work hours, like all through the night. So it literally worked like a factory. So you'd have stock ache and a waterman there during the day making the record and then Phil Harding would come in in the evening and work all through the night mixing those records. All those people. Phil Harding told us so many amazing things like uh, uh, how he remixed Better the Devil You Know because that was the turning point where Kylie suddenly had some power and she and Terry decided that they were going to wield some power at Stock Aitken and Waterman and not just be passive receivers of what they did. And Kylie, through Terry, demanded final approval on the mixes starting with better the devil you know wow. and when she got the first mixes of better the devil you know she refused them she said no not what i want i want this and that and the other send it back do you know why were they too light and bubbly yes they were right. too they were too much like the first two records okay. uh, from what, what we're hearing she wanted to mature her sound and it, it bounced back a few times she refused it a few times and then phil harding did the final mix that we're so aware of with a lot of the, you know, the oh, 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 and all, all those little moments, those 
amazing little moments. He and added it's got so a bit of a dark of undertone too. Yeah. I, I even remember at the time, like, of course, it's not a dark song. It's a joyous song. But compared to her earlier stuff, I remember thinking this has got a, like, it's a, the word I use is a bit over dramatic, but there's some songs that I love that have this sinister undertone. Yeah, well, that, uh, like that's a bit of a, me, has it? Yeah, that's a bit of a, a sore thing that you have a boppy, upbeat vibe, and some of the lyrics can be quite dark. Absolutely, never too late. Yeah, you have that contrast. You have mm. that contrast, which is you know great. It's uh, it's what my colleague Gavin calls the tears on the dance floor thing. Yes. Which they used to nail, yeah. Tell me this, in your travels, I mean, my God, doing this podcast, you must have had some revelations. Can, can you help us or give us just your perspective on where's the relationship at now between Stock, Aiken and Waterman? They were so close. They they all had quite distinct roles in their heyday. What's the relationship between the three gentlemen like these days? It's good enough that they were, uh, appeared in the same room for a recent Channel 5 documentary. And you've got to think, given their past relationships and all they achieved together, there would be some love there. I think there is. But at the same time, there's obviously pain and disappointment there. And when you think about what is the one thing that is almost guaranteed to destroy friendships, family, relationships, anything, and that thing is money. And I know that uh, Matt and Mike did take Pete to court about they felt they were owed more money. Uh, that court case ended up being dropped and they moved forward because originally, it- they, like when they started out, it was a handshake deal. And that's the other, the other great lesson in life. No matter how what good friends you are with somebody, when you're going into business together, get everything in writing. Everyone can have the purest intentions. No one's out to screw anyone else. But when there's different perceptions of what you've agreed to, that can create chaos. So it's better to have, you know, everything in black and white. And I think ultimately that that destroyed their their working relationships. Well, but it would that be was one of the things. Yeah. Very true, wouldn't it, to say that Pete Waterman walked away with the absolute lion's share of them. I mean, he's filthy rich. We know that. Um, deservedly so, some may say. Um, would it be fair to say that they were a trio, but he got the lion's share of the wealth? I would say he got more because it was he he was he was the business side of it. Like he put down the money for the studio and all that sort of stuff. So it's not really it, it's not really unfair in itself that he would get more money because he created the business. Whereas, I mean, the the, the Mike Stock and Matt Aitken created the, the line show of the music. They're the creative force, but he was the he was the business element of it all. You're coming towards the end of your podcast. How are you working towards getting Pete to come on the show? We we will continue to approach him. <laughs> but my, my feeling is, and I, I, we've said this before, that although we would absolutely love to have him on, his voice has been his voice has been heard. It's not like he's not mm. a miss he's not a missing piece of the puzzle. Wow, that's he's a good given, way of thinking about it. He's given many many interviews. We know he's written a book, and I will semi regularly quote pertinent parts from his book. So his voice is there in what he's said publicly, and I'll quote him from interviews. But no, he, he, he's very welcome to come on the show. We'd love to have him on the show. But my gut feeling is that he likes to be the ringmaster and I, and I kind of think that he knows that in our situation he wouldn't be. So how did the stock ache and water the hit factory, how did it all come to an end? I'll give you my layman's uh, version of events. I, I sort of tend to recall as the listener back in the day that, their style and their music just sort of got gobbled up by this unbelievably um, momentous new sound. It was a harder sort of street sound, a uh, rappy kind yeah. of early 90s sound. It, would it be fair to say it was as simple as that, that they, they got gobbled up by a new, a new wave? In a way, but there was some groundwork laid for that, which was that, you know, in the beginning they, were inc- they had their ear incredibly close to the ground, so they were ahead of the game with changing with the times, with high mm. energy, with house music, with Eurobeat, with rare groove. They were all ahead of that game. And then right at the end of that cycle, they, the Hit Factory era starts and they became their own genre. 
And I think when you're your own genre, you're, you're not evolving. You you are your own genre. You're just producing stuff which fits within your the realms of that sound. And the, the pressure to evolve wasn't as intense. And then all of a sudden the bottom drops out and new sounds have come along and swept you away, which is, well, you're talking about things like Too Unlimited and all that sort of thing. Um, and, and that Too Unlimited were actually licensed by PWL. So they released them in the UK and that caused a lot of resentment within the building that, you know, uh, the Saw Records weren't getting the priority that things like Too Unlimited were. So you had the commercial pressure of, of you know, they, they weren't having as big hits anymore. That created, created huge tension. So um, I, I know Matt Aiken told us, you know, there were a run of really, really good records that they put out, like um, Boy Crazy, That's What Love Can Do. That's a fantastic record. If you haven't heard it, listen to it. What was um, that so one? That's What Love Can Do. That's What Love Can Do. It was a, a, actually a top 20 in America a few years later. A delayed release over there was huge, but it, it I'll did look nothing. It up. In, I'm sure yeah. I would have heard it, but I'll look it up. amazing that that was them at their best and mm. it flopped and what does that do to you when you when you know you know for a fact you just made one of your best records and i would 100 percent agree that's one of the best records they ever made and it doesn't even make the top 40 and, so know, why is that matt was it just that the times like they weren't in in vogue anymore yeah but i mean it, it, it's partly because the gatekeepers have just decided no more so you don't get playlisted you don't get right. club play um, you might get a little bit of play on, say, kids' TV or something like that. But, you know, once the gatekeepers have moved on, that's it. Um, it's over. And, you know, they made brilliant records with Lonnie Gordon and um, Sybil in that phase that didn't do anything. And I think Matt Aitken was like, what's the point Yeah. anymore? Because he was stressing himself. It's a very highly stressed job. You're doing your best and it's not getting anywhere. And I think that was the beginning of the end for him. So he left. So then it was just um, Matt and Mike. Uh, so then it was just Pete and Mike for a while. They continued on. Mike got more and more alienated by acts like Two Unlimited sort of getting the priority in his records, not getting released anymore. Pete Waterman sold half the company to Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers, according to him, would not release some of their records. So it was like a constant battle to get anything released. And then the, the turning point was um, Dead or Alive came back and signed with them and uh, Pete Waterman did a deal with them, which would be a song split between two of the guys from Dead or Alive, Waterman and Stock, so four people. And Mike said, hey, I'm writing almost all of these songs myself and I'm only getting a quarter. No, no more. So he went to Pete Waterman's office and said, no, you know, we can do half. I'll, I'll get 50%. The three of you get 50%. And Pete Waterman refused. And then uh, Mike stormed out of the building and said, that's it, and he never returned. So that was the official end of Stock Aitken on Waterman. Oh, what a sad, sad end too, right? Yeah, it is a sad end. It is a sad end. But yeah, all all great sort of musical genres and labels have their have their prime. I mean, I mean, uh, when you think of pop music, and pop music historians always hold up Motown as, you know, the apex of great commercial pop music. But they only had a limited period as well. I mean, you know, oh, by the yeah. by the 70s their sound was passe so it, it's sort of it's built into the nature of pop music that there is a beginning a middle and an, and an end it can't go on forever so matt have you enjoyed uh doing this podcast was it what you thought at the beginning when you took on this project did it turn out to be what you expected or oh, my guess would be it's taken twists and turns that you didn't expect oh it's like when we first started the original like the very original idea we thought about it might have it might have been just like a bit of a fan thing where we were just chatting amongst ourselves and then gavin said oh i'm gonna i'm gonna try and get hazel dean for the first episode i said oh yeah okay and it got her. And then it was like a all of a sudden the concept became clearer and clearer, which was that we'd be interviewing all these people. And to me, the most incredible, incredible thing has been the emotional catharsis that's come out of it, not just for me, but for listeners. And, I, you know, I, I've got a really long history in journalism and I've done things that are quite high profile, but I've never done anything that has had such an intense reaction from consumers where I'm getting... In the emotional sense. Yeah, that I'm getting messages and emails where, like, I couldn't tell you. I'm getting choked up. Um, 
I couldn't tell you the number of people who told me they cried listening to it because it struck something. It felt really struck something really powerfully emotionally inside of them. And I always say that the music you listen to when you're a teenager, it becomes a part of your soul and you'll never feel the intensity that you from music that you felt when you're a teenager. It's just there's something about that era and it becomes a part of you emotionally. And people say that to hear us giving this music the credit and the credence that it deserves and taking it seriously and giving it respect strike something really powerfully inside them. And I myself, when, like, we've just finished the last Kylie, the last Kylie episode, the last Kylie single, which was Celebration. And I was doing, I was writing a script for the wrap up of her career and I was typing away and I started crying and it's just like, it's crazy because I'm not an emotional person. I probably cry every five years, you know. So it's just like yeah. it, it's, it's something inside that's so powerful that this is it's like a catharsis. Well, I echo what you say. When when you're a teenager, things are everything. They're hard. They're exciting. They're exhilarating. It's awful. And any one person who walks alongside you, whether that's a parent or a friend who held you up at that time, you'll mm. always remember that. But music is an embrace, and it was there the whole way through that difficult period and exciting period in your life. So as you say, it becomes integrated into your DNA. You'll never forget it. No. Tell me, what's the most surprising thing a guest has told you on your podcast? Oh, wow. Um, so many things. Oh, let me start. Um, do you remember Brother Beyond? They had hits with um, The Harder I Try and He Ain't No Competition. Not and quite. And Nathan was on the show and he told us um, they had a, a late-breaking top 40 hit in America and he just casually announced that to get radio play in America, to get that hit record, they had to pay the mafia a huge amount of money. Oh. Now, we, we <laughs> like, you always hear about payola, this, this idea that to get properly playlisted in America – you have to give bribes and stuff because like at, at the American charts aren't like the charts here. They were, are, or, or at least were like they were 50, 50 radio play, 50, 50 sales. Whereas in the UK and Australia, it's always been sales or now streaming. So if you get playlisted, strongly playlisted across America, you can launch into the top 40. Mm -hmm. And he told us that they paid the mafia to get that hit, which was called the girl I used to know. And I, I was just gobsmacked because that's something that's whispered about, but people never usually openly talk about it. And it just it just confirmed it. Wow, that is a revelation. And I've got to say, yeah. and again, a credit to, to you guys for, for making people feel that they can trust you because you do handle everyone's story with without judgment, I have to say. Yeah. A lot of listeners who are already listening to your show, and that's probably most of this show's listeners, I have to say, are very curious to ask that because we know you're coming to the end. What happens next? Have you got any plans for beyond this podcast? And there, and how are you going to feel when you do put the final? You cried with the Kylie chapter. What about yeah. you put the whole thing to bed? Well, that's a, like we've been going for about four years, and that's the first time I've cried. So, like, I don't want people to think that I'm some kind of emotional train wreck because I'm not. I'm just like pointing that out as now, like there's it's no bad. shame in it, son. No, there's no shame. But like, it, it just <laughs> I, I point it out because it's like. It shows the power of teenage music, how it has, yeah. ha, what it has on you for, throughout your life. Well, we've got a few ideas of what may or may not happen. Um, we'll see what happens. Oh, you're um, going all Kylie back in the eighties about her romance with Jason. You're all being coy. Well, there, the, the, but the truth is, there's nothing locked in, so I, I can't tell you anything. Um, what <laughs> I can say that it's been it's been a long time. Like we started at the height of COVID. Um, and now here we are all these years later. So it's been a huge chunk of our lives. Um, yeah. It does, it, it's not a casual thing. It involves a huge amount of research. So it's, um, I don't know how I'm going to feel when I'm not doing the research anymore because it takes up a lot of my time. You'll need to take a break. My goodness. My, that's my feeling that if we end up doing something together again, it'll be after a break, but yeah. we'll see. But I mean, I think I'm. I think I'm going to be really proud of it when it's finished because I've done a lot of stuff, and like all of us, we're not always proud of everything we've done. We all have to make a buck, um, especially in the journalism business. But this is something that I really, I'm really proud of. So, and I'd like to. Someone said to me, you know, this is like um, the de the definitive version of the story, and I'm. I was so thrilled to hear that because that's what I want it to be. I want it to be like a historical document of the era, because the thing is. 
those of us who were there at the time remember the media was run by baby boomers. They hated our music. So, and it wasn't like now where you could have your own opinion on the internet. The narratives were controlled by a small number of people who ran newspapers, magazines, and TV shows. And if they decided that a type of music was rubbish and trash and beneath contempt, that became the opinion. And this, this is the era now where people like us can seize the narrative. And we, we, I reckon we're probably amongst the first people who seize this narrative and said, no, it's not rubbish. This is really good stuff. And this is the reason why it's good. And that's why it struck a chord. And that's why I, I think it's powerful. So I'm, I'm really proud of it. And that's why it was it. all the more extraordinary, the era, because you're absolutely right. The, the, the baby boomers, the people who controlled the radio stations at the time, they did deride this music severely at the time. It was it was mocked. It's not real music. It's, it's a fad. It's a factory. The, the word factory meaning you know there's no soul, there's no heart. Um, and as you say, your your show um, puts paid to all of that. It, it gives the real story about what it actually meant for all of us listeners who are tuning into your show. And thank you again for the show, Matt. And it's called A Journey Through Stock, Aiken and Waterman. I'm sure most people are listening to it. For the few of you out there who haven't, they need to tune in because it's just more than everything we've spoken to. It's just fun too. It is fun. It's fun. I think it's joyful and that's great. I mean, I think that probably part of that is it came out of COVID. We wanted a bit of joy and yeah, happiness and um I hope we've provided that and we'll continue continue to until we wrap up, which is we're probably going to wrap up soon, sometime this year. We're just going to run out of songs and there's an end point to everything. Well, I want you to pass on my thanks to your co-host Gavin too. And Matt, it's been beautiful talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your show and thank you for uh, giving us some time. And now it's your turn. It's time to talk. Back. Hi, Tim. My name's Paul DeBen. I am a singer-songwriter from Melbourne, Australia, and I'm a big fan of your show. I have to say, though, sometimes you infuriate me and I don't agree with you, and other times I absolutely love you and I'm in hysterics. I recently listened to the episode about uh, gays for Trump, and I just want to really... Um, applaud you for keeping your guest, Peter, um, accountable for what he was saying. And it was so infuriating how he was so contradictory about his views and trans in the military. So I really want to applaud you for really standing up for the trans community and for also keeping him accountable to what his actual views are. So thank you so much, and I look forward to the next episode. G'day, Paul, and thank you so much for sending a voice memo through. Listen, yeah, talking to Peter, and I think I might have said this in the last podcast, I I actually um, really enjoy listening to views that I haven't thought about before. It's one of the reasons I listen to Joe Rogan. They have guests on there all the time, and I'm like, that is bizarre like i was only listening to one today where they were saying the guest was saying there's no such thing as memory we're all bringing our thoughts and we're draining them and streaming them from a cloud and i was like wow that is mind-blowing i love listening to different points of view but when it came to peter i was and i have listened back to it now i said that i would and i don't usually listen back to the show but yeah i still stand by the fact that it was the inconsistency in what he was saying and I just can't help but think if you really can flip-flop on your view that much then you don't have much conviction and therefore I'm not having an authentic conversation with you more than happy to hear multiple points of view love it but if you are only saying what you think others want to hear or if you're only saying something that you think is provocative because it might get you clicks or a, a, a reaction yeah, that's not a conversation I'm actually particularly interested in, even though I respect Peter's right to say what he needed to say. So I'm so, still glad that we had him on the show. As for infuriating you, Paul, well, that's my job. Hey, bro, how are you? I um, just wanted to say I heard your interview with Madam Roast Beef. <laughs> I've watched a few of his um, 
Kylie reaction videos. Do you know he was actually the? I actually was one of the ones that got him onto Kylie because I was one of the first people that told him to react to Pram Pram, and he actually put it up in his screenshot on that reaction video. But um, he might have forgotten or thought it wasn't necessary to mention me. <laughs> but no, no, that's cool. Anyway, that was cool. You had him on. Good on yous. It was a cool wee chat. He's a wee laugh, eh? Wasn't it funny how um, Madame Roast Beef said that he thought Kylie was from New Zealand? <laughs> I thought that was quite cute and funny. I was like, interesting. Usually it's the other way around. Usually they say Kiwi artists are from Australia. <laughs> Hello, Sean from New Zealand. It's lovely to hear your voice again. I'm so glad that you enjoyed our chat with Madame Roast Beef. So much feedback about Madame Roast Beef, and I'm not surprised because he is a very interesting person, very authentic, uh, very genuine, quite outrageous, and uh, clearly enjoying life, and um, a beautiful speaker as well. Speaks right from the heart. You, you certainly know where you stand with Madame Roast Beef. Nice to hear from you, Sean. I'm glad you're still enjoying the show, and I agree with you. Kylie Minogue from New Zealand. Well, Let's just say I was glad to have the opportunity to point the boy in the right direction. Hello there, mate. Hello, Tim. Hello to all that's listening. Just wanted to send this to send my fangs and, yeah, my bloody love for this podcast. I first saw and listened to an episode of yours back in 2014, uh, the Is Kylie Minogue Finished episode, when I was talking about the worries about her management and herself during a Kiss Me Once era. Even though I was a 12-year-old guy, though, Jesus, I remember listening to that, and it was basically my fours in capitalised there and then. And so from 2014 to now, 10 years later, especially with the increased episodes uh, around the business of the Tencent era, um, yeah, keep them coming, mate. Absolutely loving them. Um, and also, as a young guy myself, um, Padam, Tencent, that vibe for the next era completely, but my oh my, um, yeah, I remember hearing in a past um, a few episodes of yours, your sentiment towards my oh my, and between me and a few girlfriends of mine who like Kylie um, from Padam, and just as a kind of casual fan, um, yeah, I showed them that, and it just wasn't the one. Um, I get what they were trying to do, especially with TikTok, and uh, Tovlo and BB who are quite current and they're great around the gay community yeah it just wasn't the one but I'm um, excited to hear more especially now that the tension reissue seems to be coming up and the tour and all of that exciting jazz but um, yeah just cheers mate keep them coming and um, yeah have a great day cheers Andrew that is such a sweet message and I just don't even know where to start with uh, considering the fact that you listened to an episode of this podcast when you were 12 years old and not to mention the fact that oh the shame of knowing that I had a podcast called Is Kylie Minogue Finished but I distinctly remember it yep it was a bit of clickbait in the title we were talking about Kiss Me Once and the fact that she seemed to have lost her mojo at that time she was doing the voice and she just didn't seem happy to me. Still, looking back, I don't think she was particularly happy around that time, and it, it just bled through. So, of course, the people that support the show and try to get it listened to um, put, Is Kylie Minogue finished? But as a 12-year-old, my friend, so you're about the same age as my son, I would say, you were listening to that podcast? With your little hand on your chin going, Mm-hmm, hmm, mm, yes, I agree with that. What an old soul you are, but what a man of class too, if you've tuned into Kylie and into this show too. It's lovely to have you on board, Andrew, and yeah, sure, we'll get you on the show one day. Sounds good. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. People of Springfield, please don't eat my cats. Why would you do that? Eat something else. People of Springfield, please don't eat my dog. Here's a cat. 
They're eating the dogs. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're eating the cats. Meow, 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 meow. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. They're eating the dogs. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're eating the cats. Meow, 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 meow. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. Well, the stakes were high for both candidates during the September presidential debate, and Sean is with us to share his thoughts. G'day, Sean. Hey, how's it going? For those of you who haven't heard Sean on the show before, he's a Republican. He's been on and spoken about all kinds of things before, I think. But Sean, you must be disappointed that Kamala didn't prove herself to be a complete cackling fool. Uh, No, I'm not really disappointed because she did what the left normally does and she spewed out all the lies. There were a few ironic uh, ironic moments in the in the debate last night, um, how she said to turn the page on history. But yet she's bringing up stuff that was five, six years old and still playing it as if it's fact and preaching it like it's gospel. You know, like when she brought up the Charlottesville uh, comments about him, Trump saying that they were very fine people that has already been proven and like that it is a lie. It has been debunked. But Sean, um, uh, look, I I have no question at all that we could fact check both candidates. I mean, that, that's in all presidential debates. But let, let's get real here. Republicans thought that once you got this woman on the stage in front of a microphone at a lectern opposite this man, Trump, who they consider and uh, you know a, a master debater, say that carefully, folks. They thought that she would show herself up to be the a, a absolute fool. Would you at least concede that she stood there and didn't appear like an uninformed, uneducated fool? No, she definitely didn't. She definitely didn't come off as uneducated. She wasn't cackling. I mean, her voice does still go to my spine when she speaks, but she definitely was not. Definitely was not like uh, as uneducated as some of the Republicans believe. I never thought that she was uneducated. I believe. I don't that mind she- saying to you, Sean, that I thought that's what would happen. I really did. I thought. Oh no! I I for sure knew that she was going to come off as rehearsed and knew exactly how to like get under Trump's skin and everything like that. I I knew exactly where we were going to go. As soon as well, it you were a better place than me because I've, I've only been watching more casually than probably you. And I thought, wow, yeah. she, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I thought she ain't bright. Get her in front of uh, a debate stage and she's in trouble. But actually, I, I watched and um, I, I thought she, she did really well. I mean, very rehearsed, very scripted, but the same would be said about uh, both of them. Both would have done their research. This is the part that bothers me, though. Why can't Republicans like you just did? Just say, you know what? She did okay. She did okay. Why online at the moment is the reaction so bloody predictable and uh, so vicious, actually? Why does it have to be that way? I'll give you a list of things I'm reading, which I'm sure you are too. She lied. Uh, She was given the questions beforehand. She had the script. Oh, and my favorite one, she was wearing an earpiece. Yeah, like I I hate when they I hate when like the extreme Republicans dive into that into that realm. I'm not going to lie. I definitely don't condone that kind of behavior. But to be set to be fair, that is said on the other side as well. They will say stuff about Trump, like when when Trump got shot to this day, they say that he it was all a hoax. You'll see the extreme left. They'll say it's a hoax that he that he fabricated the entire thing. He constructed the whole entire thing and that, and then they'll start saying there's no scar on his ear. So if he had, if he got shot in his ear, why isn't there a scar? If you go and you Google all of that stuff, the same can be said about the left towards, towards Republicans. In my personal opinion, neither one won the debate last night. Nothing was learned. Nothing new came out of either one of their mouths. You just said you don't think anyone won. (laughs) Given the stakes going into it, you, you couldn't possibly say that Kamala didn't win that debate, at least by a nose or a larger margin. Because no, the reason why, she, well, I, will say, well, the reason why well, I will say that she him, didn't him, win. Hear me out on it, though. I mean, if, you, if you're going into that debate stage with the stakes as high as once she opens her mouth, she's going to prove herself a fool, and she didn't do that. And let's also be honest, she dangled bait on multiple occasions, and Trump not only took the bait, he took the hook, he took the line, he took the freaking sinker too. 
Yeah, I, I agree to a de- to a degree with you on that. Um, there were at least 25 lies that she did that were never fact checked. It was definitely a debate that was three against one because the two moderators jumping in like that and fact checking Trump on the spot like that without doing the same to her, I believe, was absolutely disgusting. That's not what moderators are supposed to do. Sean, he was rattled. I was watching a man there who was rattled and, and he didn't appear rattled at first. But when she was not making the fool of herself that he thought and when she was but it appeared to me like he might have been advised not to appear too aggressive but in his efforts to contain himself his presentation became very odd to me all i see all i saw was a fizzed up bottle of soda that couldn't release its energy and while he fizzed she was going for his manhood she used all the terminology you would use with a man like Trump, using all his own lines, calling him a disgrace, calling him weak, saying Putin would eat him for breakfast. And then the ultimate one, mocking the size of his crowds. Yeah, which is a lie, because if you saw on the news, if you would look at all of the pictures. It's not they the point it. if it's a lie or not. I hear the Republicans keep talking about all the lies she told. It, it's not about the lies. She used that strategy of getting under his skin, and she did it. He absolutely was rattled on that stage. And she got rattled too. I believe she got rattled too, especially when I he- I didn't see that. Where, where did she look rattled? Especially when he made the remark of, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. Yeah. What was that a reference to? I didn't get it. There was clearly so something when, that, right? When Kamala was uh, debating Mike Pence uh, four years ago, she interrupted Mike Pence when he was talking. I mean, he talked over her and then she stopped him and she said, I'm speaking. I'm speaking. Now it's my turn. I'm speaking. And she repeated and then she started laughing afterwards. So it was a reference to that for sure. My whole take on the whole situation was that no one walked away a winner because you didn't sway anybody. You didn't say, like, the same people that went into it loving Trump are still loving Trump. The same people that went into it loving Kamala are still loving Kamala. You didn't sway any of the independent voters because, again, you did not discuss any policy and instead you attacked one another. Well, I'm going to disagree with you on that, Sean. If I was an, a voting member, if I was a voting citizen in the United States, that would have swayed me because I was thinking that this lady was really out of her depth, really ignorant, not bright enough to be in a position of such power. And I walked away from that thinking, you know what, there's there's more to her than I realised. So she absolutely swayed me, maybe not to the point where I'd vote for her, but she, she absolutely, ch- my perception of her is totally changed. Well, then I would definitely, I would definitely invite you to look at her history, her track history, especially with the state of California, the state that I live in. And she was the attorney general for the, she was the AG for the state of California. I would definitely invite you to look into her criminal history of how she handles crime, how she handles criminals in the jail and the prison system. I would definitely invite you to look into all of that. I would definitely look into inviting you on how, as a vice president, she handled the border crisis and how she's been handling the border crisis. So that's what I mean. Like, well, I, if it's I, a and I have person, no doubt. And, I have and no me, question that matter. I would be mortified. But he, here's the problem that I feel feel for you in the United States, for all of you listeners who listen from the United States. You could look in the backgrounds of both candidates and be horrified and mortified by what they've done, their behaviour of the past, and also have it flip-flopped on positions possibly in Kamala's case. I actually don't think you've got a fantastic candidate on either side, but like I say, she certainly convinced me that she wasn't the nincompoop that people have been telling me. Let me ask you this. You live in the United oh, no, States. I, never th- I personally have never said that. I don't think she's an idiot. I don't think that she doesn't. I don't think she's uneducated. I think she's great with words when she's rehearsed. If you catch her on the spot, on a, you, and again, you can Google speeches where she... She has not had, do you realize that she has not had one press conference in the last 55 days since being nominated? She has not spoken to the press at all in the last 55 days. A lot of towns don't want to talk about it because they're so embarrassed by it. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And this is what's happening in our country. And it's a shame. 
I just want to clarify here, you bring up Springfield, uh, Ohio, and, and ABC News did reach out to the city manager there. Uh, he told us there have been no credible reports of specific claims of pets being harmed, injured, or abused by individuals within the immigrant community. Well, All I've this, seen people on television. Let me just say here, this is the... the people on television clear- say my dog was taken and used for food. So maybe he said that, and maybe that's a good yeah. thing to say for a city manager. I'm not taking this from but television. But the people on I'm television say the their dog was eaten by the people that went there. The comment that he made, that immigrants stealing cats and dogs so they can eat them, you're in the United States, I'm not. Have you ever seen an immigrant steal a cat or a dog so that they So can if you them? actually Google the story, that it did happen in Ohio. It happened in um, Canton, Ohio, I believe. But it was actually a Canton, Ohio resident that ate a cat in front of their neighbors. And the news, it's on the news. You can see it. You can Google it right now. Cat Isn't it a bit woman. disingenuous to take a, a, an isolated incident and say immigrants are coming? Like, I'm, I'm curious on your take on this. As a, as a know, Republican- I thought it was a ridiculous statement. I, think, I thought it was a ridiculous thing to bring up. Like, it was ridiculous. If anything, I really wish he would have brought up all of the American citizens that have been murdered by illegal immigrants. I wish he would have brought up that. The four-year-old getting killed and raped. I wish he would have brought up that. I wish he would have brought up the... Uh, college student that was raped in Colorado and murdered in Colorado by an Honduran illegal immigrant. I wish he would have brought up all of that because that it would was have meant been to be a- his home run. Immigration was meant to be his home run, but instead yeah. he, he just appeared as yeah, an external he sh- person. Shouldn't have brought conspiratorial. Up. It just to be sounded, honest with you, I didn't like even know. I didn't even know about that until he said that. I hadn't even heard about the stories. I had to Google it afterwards and then start looking it up and diving into it a little bit more. So there Sean, is, is he is he going to win after all of this? I mean, there's there's still a little way to go. Is he going to win? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's anything. Again, people will start like attacking me for being a conspiracy or saying I'm a conspiracy theorist. There is there is few things that I'm still questioning on what happened in the 2020 election. I, I do believe that voter fraud occurred. I don't know if it occurred in the magnitude of of he would have won. But I know for a fact that I was up in all wee hours of the night watching and monitoring the votes coming in. And I did see that in Michigan at three o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, a dump of 500,000 votes got put on Biden. And you want me to believe that all 500,000 votes that just came in all went to Biden. That's not even statistically possible. So the simple question of of will he win is difficult for you to answer, I suppose, because are you saying that the result, no matter what it is, is going to be questionable? I believe so. Yeah. Just like when in in 2016, when Trump won, Hillary Clinton for four years kept saying that it was that he won, he didn't win actually, that he shouldn't have won, that it wasn't his win, that he didn't win, that she should have won. But it was okay that we for four years had to listen to the Democrats say that. You can Google all of that too. That's all on record. That's on that she, that he didn't win, that she should have won, he didn't win, that there was some conspiracy of how he won, and that Russia con- colluded, which actually was another lie that she talked about last night, and has already been tr- pr- uh, proven false by the government, has already proven that that never happened, there was no Russian collusion, that that was all a farce, and that was all paid for and brought forward by Hillary Clinton and the DNC. That is yep. all on fact. So yes, like we're going to well, just go back and forth with that for sure. There is, uh, there is still a while to go, and anything can happen. You know, there's there's big events that can happen in an election campaign that can sway voters. So let's see what happens. So really briefly, Sean, let's return to entertainment for a minute. Although <laughs> that debate was quite entertaining, I have to say, uh, Beyonce. The nominations for the fairly respected Country Music Awards have been released. And shock horror, everyone, Beyonce's alleged country album hasn't been given a nod, not a single nomination, Sean. How could the (laughs) Queen be so disrespected? How can Queen B be snubbed? Oh, all the the Beyonce fans and the Beehive are going to definitely come for me. You can't look, you can't throw in a few banjos in the background of your music and think that you're going to become a country music star. (laughs) The country music is a different platform completely. You had a woman that literally had her manager and other people paying radio stations to put, and you can Google this, this is all on record, that 
they were paid to play her 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 music on country music. That's the only way they would play it is by being paid to play it. And you know, to be fair, her music wasn't that great on the album. There was no eye opening thing. You know, because they always try to go after her after Taylor Swift, and they always try to say that Taylor Swift, that's not fair. That Beyonce, it's because that she's that it's a black woman versus a white woman. Beyonce doesn't write her own music. She's she's not the writer of her own music. She doesn't create. Look at you her go, Sean. You don't like this woman at all, do no, you? She, I mean, no. I okay. Let's be frank. I love Beyonce music. I'm not gonna lie. I I did. I love the Renaissance um, album. I love this album. But it's not country music. It's not. Yeah, it's, you, yeah. you can brand it. You can put Dolly Parton on it. Huh? I really, I don't think she'd care. Like, I'd love to hear her thoughts about it. I wouldn't think that Beyonce's sitting there thinking that she no. would get a nomination because it's not a country album. It's what we call a pop or a country infused pop album, like Golden yeah. was with Kylie. And you know and- what? She'll get nominated, I'm sure, at the MTV Awards. She may get nominated oh, yeah. at the Grammys and all of that for it. But for the country music awards, I'm sorry, it's not. It's a completely different kind of audience and it's a different kind of music. I, to be frank with you, I'm not a huge fan of country music. So I me, despise country music. If you yeah, if I like want to hear, I'm not a huge fan. I I can probably name off the top of my head and on one hand five different musicians on the country. And I'm not speaking ill of it. I think country music is great for people that like it. I'm just not a fan of country music. So it was not shocking to me at all. Like the beehive is going to be all shocked that she didn't get nominated. And then what I don't like though, is that they're turning it into now a race thing that they're saying that because she's a black woman, that's the reason why she didn't get nominated. I haven't heard that. I don't believe at all. I believe exactly what you just said perfectly. It's a pop album with country infusion so it's not full country. So why should she get nominated for it? Because right. she called it Cowboy Carter or because there's country music or because Dolly Parton appeared on the album. Like, come on, you guys, we have to like pick and choose our battles a little better than this. This is this is definitely not something. The album was great, but it wasn't country great in, in my mind. Like, it, you know, like it's just it's, it's just not. I've never understood country music in general if i want to hear a story about a dog an ex-wife and a dump (laughs) truck i'll just read matthew mcconaughey's next autobiography another thing that kind of draws me a little bit away from her i'm not gonna lie is her politics like her politics like i don't know if you knew this too that like the dnc got like a lot of backlash because at the democrat national convention camilla girl wouldn't she yeah, like the the she she they they were selling that she was going to be performing at the DNC on the last night, and the rumor is they all said that so they could get viewers. But Beyonce never showed up. She never was on the ticket to sing or perform. She was never supposed to be there. But the DNC lied. You can Google this and put it out there, and a lot of people were upset that she did not show up, which I was actually kind of glad because I'm kind of getting a little tired. And this goes on both sides. I'm getting tired of both sides of like, I'm paying you to, to sing. I don't want to hear about your politics. I didn't pay $200 for a, for, for a ticket to come watch you sing, to hear your political beliefs, even if they aligned with mine. If you want to talk politics, sell tickets for a dinner and we'll all listen and talk about everything you want to hear about. But when it's, when I'm paying for a concert, I'm here to listen to you sing your albums. That's it. I'm not listening to your politics. And I mean this for both sides. I don't care if you say that you're a Trump supporter. If I go to a Kid Rock concert, I want to hear you sing. I don't want to hear you bash the left. I don't want to hear you praise Trump. I don't want to hear that. That's not what I paid to see. I paid to see you sing. That's what I paid to hear you do. Well, on this show, we talk about it all the time. Celebrities, they uh, they often come from nothing. They make a little bit of a name for themselves. Sometimes they get uber famous. And then all of a sudden, they think they're very self-important and the world needs to hear their views about everything, which we don't. And just for the record, I hope the country pop phase is officially dead and buried. I did enjoy (laughs) it a little bit, just a tiny bit. But Yeah. yeah, I'm done with it now. So Kylie, no more country. And Beyonce, no more country. And Taylor Swift, no more at all. Okay, thanks, Sean. I appreciate your time. Thank you again so much. It was fun. And hope to do it again. Hold down. Don't be a bitch. Come take it to the floor now. Woo!
<laughs> There's a tornado, There's a tornado in, in my city, in my city, at the basement, at the basement. That shit ain't pretty, that shit ain't pretty. Rugged whiskey, rugged whiskey. We surviving, we surviving. Over red cup kisses, sweet redemption, passing time, yeah. It's the first time we've spoken, isn't it? Yeah, and um, thanks for having me on. It's I've always listened to you over the years, so it's nice to finally talk to you. It is nice to talk to you too, because I know you've been a fan of Kylie Minogue for about as long as I have, right back to the beginning, right? Yeah, right back from Neighbours, the whole Scott and Charlene era, watching them daily in the UK. This little TV show of ours, we exported over to you guys and you lapped it up. Did you ever chase her down an alleyway? Did you ever chase any of the Neighbours gang? No, I wasn't lucky enough. Um, I didn't live in London at that time, um, but I did see a lot of it in the newspapers and that. So I was, I was really jealous. She's great. What is it about Kylie that keeps you stuck around for so long? Why do you keep um, keep on keeping on, as many of us do? Um. I think Kylie's been a big soundtrack to my childhood. Um, when she first released I Should Be So Lucky in the UK or when the song first got released, um, I remember getting this single on vinyl and saying to my parents, oh, my God, it's Lenny. I got her on. And she, you know, she's released music. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, and and I, I, I kept calling her Charlene. Um, and then I think I got the album for Christmas, I'm pretty sure of it, or my birthday. And I've been hooked ever since then. And I think her music, her PWL music, um, was just a huge part of my childhood, which was a happy childhood, but she was like the added bonus to it. I used to listen to her daily on her, on the albums and singles and that. So, Yeah. We've, uh, by the way, for people listening, we've had to record this very early. I'm going away, so I won't be able to uh, put something fresh, I suppose, just before we upload this podcast. So we're back in time and lots might have happened, but Christian and I are about to have a quick chat about what we know so far about the new era, which is Tension 2, as it turns out. Literally, they're calling it Tension 2. Apparently, there were plans to reissue tension but they've scrapped those and they've moved on to tension to a brand new album altogether with the exception of my oh my which appears to be uh one of the tracks on the album let's start with the artwork christian with the the rumored artwork which will probably be confirmed (laughs) by the time (laughs) this is listened to by anyone how do i describe it A, a sunset with kylie on a gemini sign looking angelic in the middle of the album and it's got tension too written across the top in the same font that we used for the tension era what did you make of it when you first saw that um i didn't like it (laughs) um i just thought it looked tacky yeah if that's the right word and it kind of reminds me of um aphrodite a little bit do you know, Christian, for me, it's it's like a really cheap version, a, a cross between Aphrodite and Light Years. We've got the the breaking day behind her, like Light Years, and a bit of yeah. an Aphrodite feel in her imagery. But I don't know, is, isn't there a saying that blue and green should never be seen? Yeah, there is. Do you, with, this out, with this new album, do you think it's the, the old album mixed in with new songs or tracks, or is it a new album altogether? No, no. It's looking very increasingly likely that they will. it's brand new. Every track will be brand new, like I say, with the exception of My Oh My. In fact, let's go through some of that. So the tracks that are known to be on the album at this stage, or strongly rumoured to be, uh, someone for me, which has vibes reminiscent of S.G. Lewis and Robert Miles, which would be exciting to me, Christian, yeah, if I knew yeah. who those two people were. Uh, my Oh My and Good Is Gone are confirmed to be on the album. The track Got Me Good brings a disco flair and might make the final cut. There's another track, Night Owl, is described as a Kylie classic and could be included. Don't you love it when they say Kylie classic? It's like, what? what is yeah. that? Um, yeah. Taboo, 
A Song Called Taboo is also rumoured to be on the album. And then there's the one I'm excited about, and I think a lot of people are, is Acid Disco, which was written by Kathy Dennis, who, of course, wrote Can't Get You Out of My Head and After Dark, produced by Miraway. And look, it, it's not confirmed to be on the album. It might have even been ris- written for disco or an earlier album, but that's another one floating around. And then, of course, we have the the album cover itself. Uh, it's it, Look, we're in for a treat. I don't want to be negative, but I've just as soon as I saw that album imagery, I thought fan, what do we all think, Christian? A fan made that? Uh, yeah, I think a fan made that, and it's just going around the internet quicker than anything. Do you still think that, though? Because I'm thinking we're wrong. I'm thinking it's the real deal. But the only thing I don't like about um, the album title was Tension 2. Whether, whether it's because she's announcing, apparently announcing a tour next year and she wants to carry on with that whole Tension era. Exactly. Um, I don't get that. I think it should be renamed and repack it, whatever. But um, the album cover doesn't cut it for me. Yeah, so you're right. There's two separate elements here, right? There's the the name and then there's the cover. For me, I don't mind the name because I've been saying for the longest time that if she's going to capitalise in the US, which she's trying to, and apparently in March she's going to be touring the US, uh, whether or not that's the light version of the full tour that she's about to do, who knows, because she's done that before, right? But I always said she needs to <coughs> remind people of Padam Padam and Tension. So I'm not surprised about yeah, the name yeah. title. <laughs> album cover, I still can't believe it. Some people are coming around to it. it. Is it meant to look like a little piece of art that you'd find in a European gallery or something, maybe? I don't a know. A watercolour. I don't know, but it just, to me, just looks tacky. Just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it just looks, yeah. doesn't look... It, I, You know, if she's trying to sell a tour with that imagery or that cover, I don't think it's going to really cut it. I prefer the tension original cover that's a great cover um but i just as soon as i saw it i just didn't appeal to me at all we've been around since the beginning christian whenever we see a new album cover there's a wow factor with kylie right there's always a wow factor even kiss me once when i first saw the image of that i was like wow that's awesome aphrodite which was shot by will baker i was like wow that's pretty cool take a close look and you go oh that's a polystyrene but that's all right. Still looked wow. This was the, one of the <laughs> maybe possibly the only time I've ever first seen an album cover and went, oh, oh, <laughs> that's, that's how yeah. I. And then I and then all I thought was my absolute second thought, which came in two seconds after my first thought of oh, was no, nah, that fans made that and not very well. But no, it's looking like it's the real fan, deal. Mm, I don't know. I think a fans made it. I don't know. You're so unhappy with the cover, you're determined that it's a fan <laughs> must have made it. <laughs> so there was when the Christmas album came out, there was uh, there was imagery floating around the internet. It didn't turn out to be the Christmas album cover. So perhaps it is a fan made, maybe. Maybe. We we can cling to hope, Christian. I think yeah, I think the can. hope is fading though. By the time yeah. this is listened to, by the time this comes out next week. Yeah, it's going to be on Amazon and confirmed. <laughs> um, the other thing they I got confused by is they kept referring to Kylie as a Hollywood diva, right? And I was like, God, these morons who write this stuff, she's not a Hollywood diva. But what I've started to realise is I think that she's about to play a character in the video for the lead single, which is going to be called Lights, Camera, Action. I think I've got that right. Lights, camera, action. And I think she's going to play a Hollywood diva. Apparently the video has already been shot. It's in the can, as they say. It was shot in Hungary. And I think she's going to play maybe like a paparazzi-chased Hollywood diva. Lights, camera, action. It makes sense, right? Lights, yeah. camera, action. Yeah. Kylie running yeah. away from the paparazzi. Yeah, that does make sense. Apparently it's a yeah. banger. So forget the cover and the imagery for a minute. Apparently the music's really good. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, what, what's your favourite album cover, Cardi? Then, going to ask you. Oh, a rhythm of love, rhythm of. Oh, love. really? Yeah. Um, Only because you know it, it, what is it? Art's very personal, right? So I'm probably objectively, it might not be the best album cover, but for me, when I held that, 
for whatever the era was. It went for more than a year, I think, the Rhythm of Love, and they repackaged it with the gold sleeve and all of that. It just, the simplicity of the way she looked, she looked like a girl from Sydney on Bondi Beach with the jeans yeah. and, the, and the crop white top. and But she also looked stunning and glamorous at the same time, but to the point where she was still relatable. I love the way it didn't take up the whole album cover. She was moved right aligned, I think, in it. The pose and just everything it represented because it represented the album and the album is just so special to me. Not a, not a dud track on that album. Yeah, that's a good one though. And how about yourself? Um, probably Impossible Princess, actually. I think it's my favourite. Yeah. yeah, it's my favourite Kylie album ever. 3D, yeah, it's got to be 3D. Yeah. Um, it's just my favourite Kylie album ever. I, I like the whole imagery, the 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 way she was looking, and um, every song on that album she wrote or co-wrote. And yeah. then it's very special to me because it got released. It didn't do that well in the charts. Um, but back in them days, you didn't have the internet or anything, and. So when we, if you, I don't know, you just felt so alone with that album because no one was really celebrating it. If that makes sense. And that was a well, special thing, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a special thing, yeah. Especially yeah, because I, as a Kylie fan, we'd never felt, I'm going to use your words, alone with an album. We'd never felt that because she'd always had such success. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, and then with this one, it felt like, oh, nobody else is looking at this album, but we we knew what it was and it was very special can i tell you that album cover apparently well it was certainly shot by her boyfriend at the time and apparently they worked through the night so it had quite an energy that uh photo shoot itself had quite an ah. energy because he was setting up the lights so carefully and the camera it took hours and kylie's not the most patient person she'd get it let's get it done but yeah, they went from apparently people will correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently easily like 10 p.m. right through to the next morning they worked on getting all that light absolutely perfect. There's a little story behind Impossible Princess as well. Um, Kylie was recording at Peter Gabriel Studios in Box okay. in Somerset, which was about I'd say around about four or five miles away from me. Um, I didn't know at the time that Kylie was uh, recording down there. Um, apparently, Steve Anderson was down there as well. Um, my mum knew somebody that was working there. Um, she was a cleaner at the studios. Um, again, I, I was the last person to know that Kylie was there. My mum grabbed a couple of CDs from my bedroom, gave it to the cleaner, um, and then the cleaner passed on to Kylie, or Kylie's assistant. I can't remember much about what she was saying. And Kylie signed the CD albums for me and a personal postcard um, oh. with the cowboy style imagery. Um, yeah, she signed that to Chris left Kylie. And then um, my mum, I think she put it on my bed, got home from school or work, one of the two. And it was there. And I was like, oh, what happened? How? Where? <laughs> and by the time... Um, it was all done and dusted at the studios. Kylie had left, so um, yeah, that's kind of. I think that's a big reason why I love that album so much. I've got that little added bonus to it. Oh, Christian, that is so beautiful. Like that, the, there's such beauty in that story. You and your mum's relationship, the fact that she went to such trouble, she wanted to surprise you, and of course, Kylie being so receptive to you know knowing she was probably going to make someone's day by signing yeah. those albums. Yeah, that's so freaking special. Is, well, you yeah. know what my mum said when she saw the Impossible Princess cover? What's that? Um, she said, uh, my mum's British. She looks like she had a lobotomy. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me never show you an album cover again. Go away. <laughs> so now well, I can never, ever look at that album cover ever again without thinking <laughs> my mum was ever so slightly right. <laughs> Um, well, when I first played Impossible Princess to my mum, and the first track is Say Hey, my mum turned around and said, what is this? Sh and I was like, it's Kylie. She was like, really? What's happened? 
the first track is too far, isn't it? Oh, too far. Sorry, yeah, too far. Yeah, my mistake. And I've got to say that that was exactly the response that my family gave to, not my mother, but uh, um, it was my in-laws at the time, and I put it on. And you know, it's pretty. It's a pretty hard sound that too far intro, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, you have to turn it up loud. Yeah, and I got exactly the same response. What the hell is this? Mm. Yeah. I mean, and to be yeah. to be fair, I was thinking the same thing the first I listened, but just not in a negative way. I was like, oh, this is really not Kylie, but that's what we knew we were going to get. Like we'd been told, she'd been told she was working on something different. So yeah, what a great exactly. album though. Yeah. Are you looking forward to the Tension 2 uh, era, Christian, and the world tour? Um. I'm not sure about the album yet. <laughs> Until everything's confirmed with the cover and that. Um, like the thing is with me, I've really cut back on my collection over the years. Like, I mean, I used to go out and buy everything highly, but um, more nowadays I'm exploring the world a lot more. So I don't buy every 20 million albums that Kylie releases on the bomb release. Yay! Um, <laughs> Don't support the scam. Don't support the scam. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so obviously I will buy it. I probably will buy it just to, to support Kylie. Oh, of course. Um, One copy is reasonable, but 15 yeah, exactly. is not. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, with the tour, um, I recently saw Kylie at Hyde Park this year. Sorry, you because, did? Yeah, yeah. Oh, congratulations. That was amazing from the It was an amazing seen. show. It was an amazing show. Um, and the thing is, when she first comes out on stage, I always forget how small and tiny she is. And it just kind of, I've had that surprise moment again with her, how tiny yeah. she is. I still can't get over that over, what, 35 odd years. Um, but that show was, that show was good. Um the only two songs that ruined it for me was Slow and Love at First Sight kind of ruined uh, it, it for me. I, I liked the a... slow version she did, but, um, and, yeah. uh, but the Love at First Sight, honestly, it, she'll never stop. She will never stop. But if she plays it again, I really want to throw myself off the balcony. <laughs> it's just draining. I mean, I know she, I appreciate she's got a lot of new fans. There was a lot of new fans there that night. Um, so I'm hoping this tour next year, She's going to be celebrating disco because we've had none of that really, yes. and yes. Um, tension. Um, but throw in some PWL melodies and get Yay. the disco going. That's what Yay. we want. It's what us old fans want. Yeah, um, not <laughs> listening to Love at First Sight, slow <laughs> kids. Twice you know nuts. what? She'll she'll come out of the stage and she'll be singing lights, camera, action, and you and I will be at the back of the stadium going. Play It's No Secret. Play It's yeah. No Secret. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, there is a bit of that. And no medley, by the way. I disagree with you on that. Just play the bloody whole song. and Play the whole thing. In fact, you know what? Um, I hate to use an expression that is so overused in another podcast about Kylie, but let's manifest. Okay, let's manifest uh, Kylie doing what Jason Donovan did with 10 Good Reasons. Do the first Kylie album. From yeah, track one through to I think it was ten. Play it in order. <laughs> yeah, a like a, yeah. an anti tour of one album. Yeah, anti tour would be good. Number two, that'd be good. Yeah, that's coming. But you know that will yeah. come the next lull. So after she, after she's coming just off a lull, like after Aphrodite, huge high, and then into that lull, she it was perfectly timed to do an anti tour. So we'll get it eventually. I promise you that. Yeah. Do you think hey, Christian, I noticed. Go, go ahead. Carry on. Go on. Carry on. <laughs> no, please. No, you go. Do you think ever? Do you think Kylie would ever slow down a bit? I hope. In not. the words of, I think over the last five years, six years, I think she's slowed down on tours quite a bit. She's. I think she's had the opportunities. Oh. oh, do you mean she's slowed down as in she's not doing them as often, or the actual energy yeah. while she's on stage? Um, she's just not doing a mystery. She's not good. She does these one-off shows. Well, um, I don't think that that's sort of by design, though. Like, obviously, with COVID, that's an easy explanation. She would have toured disco, yeah. Um, yeah. but that wasn't possible. So we got the what was it? The midnight 
dropped uh, midnight. What was it called? Disco in not disco in dreams because that was um, the first tour. Um, midnight <laughs> infinity disco? disco. Infinity, right? Yeah, I'm thinking midnight because I think it dropped at midnight here in Australia at least. Um, and then after tension, she was doing her Vegas thing. And so, look, no, I don't. I really don't look. I don't know if this is Australian um, to say this, but we're pretty hard workers. Australians get out of bed and, and especially if we've got a job that we enjoy, we, we work, we toil. That's what we do. And I don't, I think Kylie would be a bit lost if she wasn't working. So I don't think she yeah. will slow down in terms of touring. In fact, it can only increase now, can't it? Cause it has, you're absolutely right. It's been very quiet on the touring front for a long time, doing lots of festivals and stuff like that instead. But now we're about yeah. to get the mega tour of the mega tours about uh, it, uh, starting apparently the rumor is in uh february in australia which by the way they usually sell tickets like months ahead so i don't know if that's particularly true but apparently this tour might start in australia go to the united states and then go to united kingdom for a finale okay it's going to be big christian can you yeah. imagine the, the, like oh can you imagine? Well, you can because you went to Hyde Park. I still haven't seen her since Golden. Oh, well, I saw her at World Pride, to be fair. Golden seems like a long time ago. <laughs> it sure does. And it wasn't the best tour. Like, I really enjoyed no. it. But it was the venue that ruined it more than the tour for me. I was in that horrible ICC centre in Sydney, and most listeners wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But it's it's like the side of a mountain. Like, it doesn't slope neatly up to the top of the stadium it's like a v practically vertical and i was standing every time i stood during the concert i felt like i was going to fall flat on my face on the stage it was horrific i hated oh. that angle it's a horrible venue and the sound isn't good either in my opinion there's my wins for the day christian i noticed <laughs> on your socials that you're on a bit of a health kick at the moment yeah i am um I've lost Good for you. Back. It sounds like you're doing beautifully as well. Like you, you really regimented, routine, healthy eating, lots of exercise. Are you feeling good? I'm feeling good. I had a scare from the doctor. I had a number of blood tests, um, high cholesterol, pre-diabetic, and really? being overweight. So that really kicked me um, to basically do a clean health um, with eating going to the gym regularly three, four times a week. And yeah, I'm feeling good. And actually, um, when I was at Hyde Park, I felt really good as well because I felt really like slim and felt really, yeah, good. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a roller coaster of a ride, but I've got there and I'm happy with where I am now. So that's good. But Christian, they, they, they often talk about, or the focus is often on appearance when you do stuff like this, but what you've just said, is the more important thing. You feel more energy. You feel better. Your frame of mind is more positive. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, if you'd seen me eight months ago, I was overweight. I felt depressed. I had no energy. Um, and like just going to the gym like for a half hour, that's all you need is 30 minutes exercise in there. You just feel yeah. so good about yourself and you just forget about everything. You're in another world and you come out feeling so good about yourself as well. So everything's reversed for me and I'm feeling good. And I'm going on holiday next week. So that's another that's wow. another good thing as well. Good on you, mate. That That's fantastic. And for anyone listening, Thank honestly, you. Christian's Christian's advice is so sound. I know we all go through those stages in our life where you feel unmotivated and d depressed, but... Honestly, getting out of bed, even if you don't want to go to a gym, put your YouTube on while you're brewing your tea, as I do, and freaking well dance like no one's watching. Put, oh, yeah. by the way, if you want if you want to do something that will make you laugh, put on Paula Abdul's workout videos. So let me tell you this, Christian, before you go. <laughs> Jane Fonda's workout videos, she goes, step one, and you're just rolling your right shoulder, rolling your left shoulder. Anyone can do it. Then you roll both shoulders. You know, it all makes sense to the, <laughs> to, to the simple brain like mine. Paula Abdul goes, right, are you ready for a workout? And the first step <laughs> is like hop, step, jump, jump, two, 
<laughs> and then like it, so, and somehow your brain goes, okay, I can do that. Literally three minutes in, she is so more advanced than what any normal person can do. <laughs> so you just <laughs> end up doing it. My daughter goes, you're not doing it. And I go, well, I can't. So I'm doing my own thing. I have to keep moving. <laughs> like, what can I do? <laughs> You've got to watch Paula Abdul's workout videos. Three minutes in and you're just like, this lady is insane. How on earth does she think that I could do this? yeah yeah i also did um, a 5k run as well raised money for charity i raised 500 quid um i did that about three wow. three four weeks ago good uh, for you, you. Know, for losing the weight in that i thought i'm going to keep all right some another motivation let's sign up for this and i did 5k run under 40 minutes so i was quite happy with that and 5k that's that's yeah that's especially if you didn't stop because i would have stopped every three minutes and just clung onto a branch and got my <laughs> breath so congratulations and you look amazing Thank mate you. too you look really you look trim you look fit and most of all you just look glowy you know so good on you thank you appreciate that i mean that means a lot to me cheers no, my, my pleasure. It's very inspirational when you see, you know, everyday working schmoes like you and I taking control of, of their life to any degree. I think it's a fantastic thing. Christian, we're going to be excited. I think that let's forget the album cover for a moment. The rest of the year is going to be fantastic. Kylie's coming, friends. Kylie's coming. Yeah, she's coming. And honestly, I can't wait for it all. I know I sound a bit moany about certain things, but no, nah, we've got Kylie back on stage. That's the main thing. Being moany about certain things is the privilege of being a Kylie fan. We're allowed. We're absolutely allowed. Yeah, I exactly. don't like the font. I don't like <laughs> the colour of the vinyl. I don't like the dress she's wearing. That's just our right as a Kylie fan. We're allowed to do that, Christian. We love her regardless. Yeah. It's been yeah, lovely exactly. meeting you. Yeah, and you. Nice talking to you.